record-breaking cyclone activity, explosive volcanic eruptions, powerful earthquakes, and endless heat waves. 2015 was marked by a number of exceptional natural disasters. terrifying events, 20,000 lives lost, and more than $42 billion worth of damage. 2015 was a record-breaking year in several categories. Tropical storms of unprecedented strength, interminable droughts, and the highest temperatures measured in the last 130 years. Is this the result of global warming? Or could other factors, such as El Nino, be to blame? How do scientists try to forecast these cataclysms? Is it possible for inhabitants to anticipate and prepare for these natural events? From the mountain range of the Andes to the Himalayan plateaus, past the frozen wastelands of Iceland and the paradise islands of Vanuatu, Scientists try to unravel the mysteries of the planet's mood swings. Using only professionally shot footage, capturing the heart of the action, this film presents the major natural disasters of 2015, from the least deadly to the most dramatic. Typhoon de Juan was emblematic of natural disasters for 2015, which hit Taiwan in September. 500 millimeters of rain, the equivalent of four months of precipitation, fell within 24 hours. Taiwan sits directly in the Pacific cyclone path, and the Taiwanese government is used to warning the population to stay indoors and evacuating areas that are most at risk. According to Fabrice Chauvin, cyclone specialist at Meteo France, the official French weather forecaster, the island of Taiwan is closely monitored by the scientific community. Taiwan is in a zone that is often hit by cyclones. The west of the North Pacific is the zone that has the most tropical cyclones. Out of all the cyclones, they receive about 60% of the year's cyclones. The impact of the storm was particularly visible on the coast. The shoreline was devastated by huge waves that were the result of two events, the typhoon itself and the closeness of the Earth to the moon, which generated a storm surge. The level of the sea rises because of the depression caused by the cyclone. Because there is less pressure on the sea, the sea finds its balance a bit higher than normal. So we have a rise in sea level. In response to the emergency, the floodgates of dams were opened to compensate for the sudden influx of rainwater. This huge rainfall is due to surface sea temperatures being abnormally warm. This stimulates the number and intensity of North Pacific cyclones. A total of 29 have had wind speeds higher than 180 kilometers per hour in 2015. This unusual activity sets a record for the year to date. So many cyclones raged over the Pacific Ocean that this film shows a mere sample of these extreme weather events. It's 6 p.m., the end of the day in the tourist region of the Great Lakes, 50 kilometers from the town of Puerto Montt. In this peaceful area, residents suddenly hear sounds coming from underground. A mysterious rumbling rolls over the foothills of the Andes. No other warning, no other signs of alarm. Just 15 minutes after the first sounds are heard, the Calbuco volcano, dormant for four decades, sends a plume of thick smoke into the air.
There was very little precursory activity at Calbuco. The Chilean Hata station close by, and just one hour before the eruption, uh, they observed a signal that uh, was interpreted to detect a magma coming up through the volcano. The entire Andes mountain range is a highly active volcanic area. It's in a subduction zone where one continental plate is forced under another. Uh, when the subduction zone is going down, it goes through transformation and the, all the seawater is pressed out, will enter into the mantle and lower the solidus so the ma magma comes up. This column of ash is a result of high pressure gases trapped in the magma inside the volcano's reservoir. As the gases are forced out, they lose pressure and swell, taking with them small particles of lava. The plume is unusually high, rising 20 kilometers above the surface of the Earth between the troposphere and the stratosphere. If the column of ash were to collapse onto the town of Puerto Montt, and its 220,000 inhabitants, the results would be devastating. You have a thrust coming up, and uh, it's diluted in contact with the uh, atmosphere, so you form a kind of a, a mushroom shape on the top. And when this is no longer uh, sustainable, it will fall down, and you can form a pyroclastic flows that will fill the uh, lows, the valleys, etc., and can flow uh, very hot material and be very devastating. Fortunately, the wind from the Pacific picks up, pushing the plume to the east where the mountains are unpopulated. The ash spreads to Argentina, where the authorities are forced to close the airspace. The ash is a dire threat to aircraft engines. Very small particles, less than 10 micrometers in size, are uh, not very healthy to, uh, to uh, breathe because they, they have sharp edges and they can cut uh, a little bit of your interior. Puerto Montt is spared, for the moment. As a precaution, a 20-kilometer zone around the volcano is evacuated. After a period of calm, as night falls, there is a second explosion. The eruption enters a new phase with electrostatic charges of volcanic lightning bolts exploding above Calbuco's crater. Afterwards, there were bolts of lightning. They were really low. It was an incredible cloud. We could see it in the middle of the night, really close by. A cloud of sand arrived. It was everything. We thought it was hailstones falling. Though the eruption lasts three days and nights, no human lives are lost. The surrounding countryside, however, is destroyed. 210 million cubic meters of ash smother houses, forests, rivers, and plains. The next day, I was one of the first to arrive in the area to see what it was like and I found the restaurant like this, completely flattened. The entire restaurant is lost. I was born here and grew up here, and I would like to keep working here. It's just an accident of nature. Could happen here or anywhere. It's destiny. A garage collapsed, and the roof of an older house broke and twisted. We tried in vain to get fuel and food for the dogs because we didn't bring anything with us. And we only managed to get back into our house the next day to see what damage had been done. 
The lava ejected from the volcano caused little remaining damage within the five kilometer perimeter. The real threat came from the tons of ash that accumulated on the roofs of buildings, which could have collapsed at any moment. 6,000 people were evacuated in order to avoid the risk of being trapped. Here, there is about a meter of ash that has fallen. That's what we're trying to remove at the moment. This is also a tourist area, so there will be an economic impact. Regarding the farms, it looks like the ash will be a major problem for the livestock. You may have volcanic gases coming along if they are very rich in fluorine. And this fluorine uh, can stick to the, uh, to the uh, surface of the uh, ash grains. And if the animals eat a lot of uh, the fluorine, they will lose their teeth and their bones. But the main thing is the roofs of houses collapsing and pollution of water sources. Not a drop of drinking water remains. Ash and sulfur contaminate all the rivers. In some areas, the layer of volcanic debris is so thick that the water is no longer even visible. We have four days until Wednesday, when it is due to rain. So we need to have finished the houses that are in this state before then. Rain is not to be taken lightly in this area of Chile where clouds loaded with water from the Pacific Ocean are blocked by the Andes and release their charge in violent storms causing landslides of mud and ash. Several months after the events, with the benefit of hindsight, volcanologists play down the effects of the Calbuco eruption. Then there was a small eruption, well, important for those living close to the volcano, but small uh, the volume is being estimated, maybe it's around 0.1 cubic kilometers, not much more than that, I presume. Although the Chilean volcano took no human lives, it nevertheless caused $600 million of damage. The calamity that spared the Chileans hit the residents of another volcanic area. Five years ago, after 400 years of inactivity, the Sinabung volcano awoke. Since then, its eruptions have been both regular and dramatic. The last one took place in June 2015. Usually, Sinabung's lava is thick and flows slowly. But this time, the volcano generated impressive pyroclastic flows. These are thick clouds of ash and lava particles that rise up and then collapse under their own weight, sweeping down the flanks of the volcano. 11,000 people were evacuated and moved this year a catastrophe for the farmers who could no longer access their land and resources for several months. Even though the volcano appeared to be calm, one person was killed when he breached the restricted area. Pyroclastic flows are difficult to predict and can extend up to four kilometers around the crater with a cost of $145 million in agricultural damages. The 2015 cyclone season was particularly brutal in the Pacific. The main culprit is the return of El Nino, a weather phenomenon that appears on average every three to seven years. El Nino is carefully monitored by long-term forecasters like Jacques Richon, who works on the three-month forecast of Météo France. Il s'agit d'une anomalie de la température de surface de l'océan dans le Pacifique. Habituellement, c'est ce qu'on voit sur ce schéma. 
Euh, les vents dominants sur le Pacifique sont des trade winds which qui poussent les eaux les deux surfaces les plus chaudes vers l'ouest. Et puis, vous avez la situation avec El Nino, où on voit que les zones rouges se sont décalées vers le centre et l'est du Pacifique. Avec les plus hautes températures, entre 26 et 30 degrés, beaucoup plus à l'est. Et dans l'atmosphère, la contrepartie côté atmosphère, c'est qu'au-dessus de ces eaux les plus chaudes, il y a aussi les orages les plus violents. La convection est stronger and precipitation is much stronger. Not all El Nino events are alike, and this year, a particularly strong effect has been announced. On est parti pour avoir un El Nino euh, fort. We're heading for another strong El Nino, one of the strongest in the last 50 years. On sait pas encore si ça va être yet, euh, record le record breaker, fort, but it's definitely cas, strong this year. Qui est vraiment fort cette année. Un El Nino, on va dire classique, a classic El Nino pas Nino won't raise the temperature more than 1.5 degrees. The 97, 98 El Nino rose to 2.3 or 2.5 degrees, depending on the area. Today, we are at 2 degrees, and we haven't yet reached the maximum. The result is an exceptional cyclone season in the Pacific. Whether hurricanes, cyclones, or typhoons, the names change depending on where they take place. These spiraling storms have beaten several records in 2015. Dans les, les in tropical les storms, as soon as the wind speed, speed, speed is higher than 120 km an hour, 74 miles an hour, they are categorized as cyclones. Une tempête tropicale. Below that is a tropical storm, and tropicale. below that is a tropical Donc, depression. Euh, en général, on prend so in general, euh, we take the forecast into account, account once it goes tropicale, above tropical depression. We start to be very vigilant when it reaches tropical storm speed at 60 km an hour, 37 miles an hour, we give it a name which allows us to follow it more easily. El Nino is characterized by an abnormal rise in the temperature of the surface of the water in the East Pacific Ocean, a vital factor in the formation of one of the most sensational events of 2015, Hurricane Patricia. In October, the effects of El Nino began to make themselves felt. According to Eric Gilliardi, climatologist and specialist of the Pacific Ocean, the water was warmer than is normal at this time of the year by two degrees Celsius. This is a zone where there are some cyclones, but not very strong. And they certainly don't develop the same size as Patricia. Patricia is directly linked to the fact that we have an El Nino at the moment. The fact that the water is warm in the east and stays warm is a source of energy for the hurricane, allowing it to develop. The source, the seeds of a hurricane, are always there. But the fact that it develops into a real hurricane of the size of Patricia is linked to atmospheric and oceanic conditions that are conducive to development. With these unusual conditions, a remarkable phenomenon occurs. Hurricane Patricia rapidly intensifies. In only 24 hours, it morphs from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane. Theoretically, any hurricane could grow to maximum strength, like Hurricane Patricia. But in general, with hurricanes, there are other factors which will limit its amplification. The water gets a bit colder, it reaches a landmass, or there are high altitude winds that destabilize the hurricane. When we look at the particular conditions of this hurricane, it really grew. There was nothing to prevent it from building to its theoretical maximum intensity. On October 23rd, Hurricane Patricia slammed into Central America breaking the wind speed record for the North Pacific with an incredible 265 kilometers per hour. The violence of the storm caused multiple casualties. Twelve people died in landslides caused by torrential rain or by falling trees. Luckily, the hurricane's path missed the largest cities on the Mexican coast. The authorities had safety measures in place prepared to house 260,000 people, but ultimately only 50,000 were evacuated. Hurricane Patricia headed inland towards the mountains, rapidly losing power. The total cost of the damages was estimated at $5 billion. The economic evaluation of natural disasters varies depending upon the countries in which they take place.
the problem with looking at it worldwide is that um, the the most expensive catastrophes happen in the richest countries. So you know, worldwide, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. Um, because of the wealth in the U.S., so the, if you have a hurricane, you know, the same size hurricane in the U.S. will cause far more cost than 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 than, than a storm, uh, the same storm in China, for example. So simply because there's much more of value, there's much more wealth in the path of the storm. Kopu is a good example of the math involved in natural disasters. When it hit the Philippines, it became the deadliest typhoon of 2015. Winds up to 210 kilometers per hour were recorded. Vast plains of rice fields were submerged by flooding due to rain and gigantic waves. Forty-seven people died in the Philippines, four times more than in Mexico during Hurricane Patricia. Yet the cost of the damage in this developing country was 20 times lower than in North America, only $231 million. To understand the intensity of this typhoon, we need to look once again at El Nino, even though this anomaly concerns the East Pacific rather than the West. The warm water moves to the east, but the water in the west stays warm. So this water is going to stay warm enough that hurricanes can develop. In fact, it's more like the area is extended during an El Nino rather than the area moving. The zone in which hurricanes can develop spreads out, so there are more hurricanes. El Nino is a phenomenon that matured in the second half of 2015. So it cannot be held responsible for the entire year's weather-related natural disasters. What would happen if global warming combined with a strong El Nino? Would the effects of the two phenomena multiply? So far, scientists are unable to tell, but numerous studies are underway. Global warming amplifies, not just for El Nino, but for everything. The whole planet les, les it amplifies extreme, existing natural phenomena. This is a combination of global warming and El Nino. We have seen that El Nino affects a quarter of the surface of our planet. So when El Nino warms by one degree, the global temperature rises by 0.1 degrees. When it comes to climatic disruption, there are other, more mysterious and less known events than El Nino and global warming. And this year, their impact was significant. One of the longest lasting and most expensive natural disasters in 2015 took place in California, where a period of drought has been ongoing for several years. And this summer, the situation is dire. The landscape is scorched. Water levels are at their lowest point, and the sun keeps shining. A highly inflammable combination that rages through the region's forests. Every year, forest fires hit the southwestern states, but in 2015, they reach epic proportions. Fire starts spontaneously in four different areas of California, as well as in Washington, Oregon, Utah, and Montana. As many as 30 fires burn simultaneously at the height of summer, mobilizing 11,000 firemen from all over the country. I was dry before simply because you had um, blocking weather systems which were pre preventing the storms actually coming into California in the winter because the, the, the rainfall in California is almost entirely in the winter and actually over the last few years there's been the weather patterns have, have um, prevented the storms coming in. The blame for the drought lies with the relatively unknown weather phenomena, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's characterized by abnormally cool surface waters in the Pacific which push warm waters to the north and south. A 
El Nino, c'est un phénomène qui revient de manière euh, épisodique tous les deux à sept ans. Là, on est sur des, des phénomènes qui oscillent à l'échelle de la dizaine d'années et euh, qui, qui apportent une anomalie de température positive le long des côtes de l'Amérique du Nord. Sur ce schéma, on voit les anomalies de température dans le nord du Pacifique. On a une zone d'anomalie dont des anomalies très très fortes. Et nous avons aussi une anomalie sur les côtes, qui est un phénomène sur une scale beaucoup plus longue, qui a commencé à l'échelle de plus longue, en 2014. Et qui a commencé au début 2014. Si il faut attribuer la sécheresse à un phénomène climatique, c'est plutôt un phénomène qui vient se conjuguer maintenant avec le Nino qui se développe. Le Pacifique Decadal Oscillation a un cycle de 20 à 30 ans and its interaction with El Nino is still not fully understood. Scientists can only state that these large-scale climatic occurrences sometimes combine, as they have in 2015. In fact, it's a good illustration of the planet. In fact, it's a good illustration of all over the planet. There are these variations of different frequencies. There's the diurnal cycle, night and day. And then we have the weather, the seasons. Et on va aussi d'une sur l'autre, El Nino, d'une décennie sur l'autre. Donc en fait, à chaque fois de la Terre, les variations more and more about. Là, sont liées à tous ces effets qu'on comprend maintenant de mieux en mieux. On a un réchauffement climatique, warming, which is ongoing. la carte de fond, and on the other hand, la Californie, une région méditerranéenne, avec très peu de pluie, et très peu de pluie. Donc, on ne peut pas beaucoup. La projection pour le futur est que si on ne fait rien, il y aura de moins en moins de pluie. Et ces régions-là, encore moins de pluie. Là-dessus, on ajoute cette variation décadale with fairly warm water off the coast of California, which has been there for several years and which reduces rainfall in this area. And now we have El Nino, which, on the contrary, is going to bring more rain. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation will continue for several years, but its repercussions will lessen as the effects of El Nino increase. This winter, there's a prediction that actually it's going to be very wet in California and maybe, maybe that will break the drought. It's not, not clear if even one wet winter will restore the water levels, but, it, but, it, but it's widely expected that it's going to be very wet in California this winter. The damage caused by these forest fires is catastrophic. It's the worst dry season in the last decade in the United States. Fires have consumed 31,600 square kilometers of land in the Southwest the equivalent of the entire state of Maryland, burnt to a crisp in a few months. Six people, including two firemen, lost their lives. 17,000 residents had to be moved to avoid being trapped by the fires. Financial loss is estimated at $3 billion, a heavy toll even for these wealthy states. In recent history, the wrath of the skies has been relatively benign compared to that of the Earth. 2015 continues this trend. Hemmed in between India and China lies Nepal, a small mountainous country the size of the state of Iowa, but 10 times more populated. 30 million souls, mostly Hindus, live in this landlocked country including one million in the capital, Kathmandu. Nepal is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. A third of its population live in rural areas, at least two hours walk from the nearest permanent road, and rely on natural resources and the cultivation of rice to survive. In the mountainous regions, there are few trees left to retain the stones that perch above the villages, bustling with small shops. According to the Hindu religion, the Nepalese people celebrate in their ancient temples the rhythm of the earth, an endless succession of periods of creation, preservation, and dissolution. Science backs them up. Geologists like Jan Klinger look back at Nepal's tectonic origins. La tectonique des plaques dans cette région, the tectonic ça plates in this region mean that India rises up at a speed of 4 cm per year. The plates that make up the Earth's crust are stuck. They become deformed over a time, and when the two plates move together, 
The upper plate, the Eurasian plate, deforms and creates chains of mountains. We squeeze the Earth's crust and create landforms. In fact, these two plates rub together. They're stuck. So while it's pushing behind, here it's stuck. And that builds up until the crust goes beyond its limit of resistance and releases, producing an earthquake, which allows the tension, the energy in the plates to be released, and this produces an earthquake. The last major earthquake in Nepal was back in 1934 and reached 8.3 on the Richter scale. In 2014, Jan Klinger published a study that suggested that the 1934 event was a warning of another imminent earthquake at this fault line. History would prove him right. <laughs> If I put that much energy into the system, a 7 or 8 magnitude earthquake will release about the same amount. So today, where have we released? Which zones have been released? Which zones don't need to be released as much? By doing this work, we're able to pinpoint the zone that broke as one of the zones that was susceptible to breaking. Jean-Louis Munier is also a geologist. He traveled to Nepal just after the earthquake to install GPS receivers that would measure any new movements of the ground. Some areas of the Himalayas, like the area to the north of Kathmandu, rose up by almost a meter in the space of a minute, because the earthquake lasted for about a minute. In other areas, paradoxically, the Himalayas sank down. For instance, some of the highest summits in the Himalayas sank down slightly for a moment. The number of deaths directly caused by the earthquake is estimated at over 8,000. Although geologists had foreseen the possibility of an earthquake, it was nonetheless impossible to predict its arrival with any precision. The way we work is that we look at historical earthquakes. We try to understand the size of those quakes in terms of destruction. Catastrophic earthquakes higher than the magnitude of 8 come about every few hundred years, between 700 and 800. And above that, you have the quakes that are only partial and which are added to the cycle. Above the epicenter, stone villages are completely destroyed by the shock wave, killing hundreds of people. The survivors are left homeless. Hello, my name is Kenji Golung. I'm 12 years old, and I've lost everything my house and even my school. When the earth shook, I was getting ready for the full moon festival. I was heating up some rice wine with myrrh that we call rakshi, just as I am now. Around me in the village, everything burned, everything collapsed. We were afraid of aftershocks, so we went into the fields. After the earthquake, we spent three days in the fields with the animals with nothing to eat. Luckily, friends from other villages arrived with clothes and food. Today we have nothing, but we still need to carry on living. Now we live up here in the fields in an encampment of tents that we built quickly using tarpaulins. But these are not our real houses. Tomorrow, we don't know where we will live. Okay. 
Le séisme de 2015 a été une catastrophe. The 2015 earthquake was a catastrophe for Nepal. Temps, But at the same time, it happened on the Saturday, on a beautiful day at the end of the morning. Matinée, so the rural population was out in the fields, the children champ, weren't at school, they were playing outside. Classe, so the destruction was not dehors. hugely catastrophic Ceci, in terms of loss of human life. If the earthquake had happened in the middle of the night or when the children were at school, it would have been much more catastrophic. In the following days, dozens of aftershocks continued to shake Nepal, including one strong tremor measuring a whopping 7.3 on the Richter scale. Another threat looms over the villages, the arrival of the monsoons. Heavy rains pound the stricken country. Water is inexorably drawn down into the earth. While it runs on the surface, it washes away the ground and turns roads to mud. But when the rainwater pours into the open wounds created by the earthquake, landslides are inevitable. And in Nepal, whole sides of mountains collapse. So, just before the monsoon, the bowl has been shaken. So you have a number of slopes that are unstable, and when you add water to that, the ground gets heavier, and fissures are going to open up because you have put water in them. So, you're going to create landslides that probably would have happened at some point, but over a longer period of time. During the monsoon, you have a massive runoff from the Himalayas. Several meters. There is a huge amount of water falling on the Himalayas, which creates small cracks. Little tremors that are nothing like the same magnitude as the major Himalayan earthquakes. This village was literally swept away by a landslide and submerged under a flow of mud. Twenty-four more victims are added to the number killed by the earthquake. That was my house. The rain swept everything away. At one o'clock in the morning, it was raining really hard, and the land slipped. Then the landslide took down 13 houses. A group of 25 people tried to help someone whose house had been buried. But they couldn't get in. There is no rest for the villagers. The monsoon season is the busiest time for farmers, tending the fields, the animals, and the crops that have survived. Down the valley, Nepal's highly populated capital city was also severely shaken. Here, one million people live above the clay deposits left behind by a prehistoric lake. The seismic waves amplify as they cross the boundary between hard rock and soft ground. Traditional houses built of stone or brick are unable to survive the quake. Only recent constructions made of reinforced concrete still stand, and only where the steel is still holding the walls and floors together. Otherwise, the lower floors that support the weight of the building collapse. 
If you go to Nepal, I just went afterwards. Not all the houses had fallen to the ground, far from it. But all the houses had been severely damaged and at the risk of collapsing. In any case, they are no longer habitable. They don't collapse during the earthquake, but they crack and break. And it just takes one slight thing to make them collapse. In all, the earthquake caused 9,000 deaths and $10 billion of damage, half the country's gross domestic product, an exorbitant cost for Nepal. In order to find survivors, rescuers risk their lives. They excavate under floors that could collapse at any moment. By intervening quickly, emergency workers saved hundreds of lives. It's extremely difficult to say it in words. Right? I was standing outside my gate when it happened. And the first shake was uh, from the west heading to the east. My gate was swinging at least three feet to the east and west because my wife, my kid and my mother were inside the house. I tried to get inside. The, the gate was swinging so extensively, there was no way I could open the gate. Uh, the road outside is paved with small tiles. There was a rattling sound as if a huge serpent is going underneath your feet. I think it was one of the most scariest moments of my life, man. I thought, I'm dead. According to Hindu belief, earthquakes are part of the third stage of nature's dance. Creation, preservation, dissolution. Of all the natural disasters, earthquakes are the most difficult to predict. We know they are inevitable, but we have no way of predicting them. In the case of volcanoes, we know that there are warning signs that we can measure. For example, small seismic events that are produced when magma rises into the chamber. But for earthquakes, we don't know what the precursor signs are. One thing is certain. The measurements gathered by Jean-Louis Meunier's team show that part of the energy stored between the two tectonic plates has not yet been released. The earthquake this year was incomplete. We're sure about that because our studies show that one part shifted between the north of the mountains up to Kathmandu. But between Kathmandu and the plains, the overlapping part remained stuck. So a second earthquake could relieve the tectonic strain with even more catastrophic results. If we imagine that my hand represents the Indian plate which is going under, here we have the mark showing the contact with the surface. So that's India and that's what's underneath. And the earthquake that hit in 2015 was a fairly deep section. What still has to shift is this part, that comes from the part that broke up to the surface. And that's another 100 kilometers. We could expect another major earthquake with extremely destructive consequences. Whether it's a question of months or years, nobody knows. The scientific community will be keeping a close eye on Nepal, fearing that a second quake is probable. Despite this alarming collection of catastrophes, has the final toll of natural disasters for 2015 been exceptional? Not necessarily, at least in terms of economics, according to Robert Muir Wood, who develops catastrophe models for insurance companies. You can see um, what is the total cost worldwide of natural catastrophes. You can see by what the losses have been. It's probably around 100 million um, euro of, of loss altogether. Um, and it's of, of that kind of order. So it, it, um, you know, th there is a, a significant amount of, of potential economic impact of, of catastrophes out there. Just on an average year, so I mean, I, I don't know what it is uh, 
the, this year in particular so far. But I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's actually um, quite a lot lower than average. So in places like Taiwan, there's, a certain, there's, there's quite a lot of insurance. So there's, there's, there's been insurance losses this year. There's very little insurance in Nepal, for example, because it's such a poor country. So this year, um, for insurance terms, it's been very quiet. Volcanologists agree with this analysis. At this stage, despite some spectacular events, 2015 has not been particularly newsworthy. It was relatively calm. It was the Kalbuka eruption. There was this part of the bunker that uh, was uh, uh, dying out. So it gave, I think, uh, uh, the scientists a little bit of time to try to understand the data they had acquired. It's a very good year when there is not too much going on. <laughs> Finally, in terms of cyclones, the year 2015 has been geographically sporadic. Globally, the number of tropical cyclones has remained stable with around 80 storm systems per year. For the Atlantic Ocean, 2015 was particularly calm if we refer to the alphabetical system that is used to name hurricanes as they appear. When there is an El Nino, in other words, warm temperature anomalies in the east of the Pacific, cyclonic activity reduces in the Atlantic. For example, in 2005, a record-breaking year, we went all the way to Z, and then when we had used up all the letters, we started at Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. And I think we were up to 31 named cyclones in 2005, which is an all-time record, because normally we have about 10 in the North Atlantic, so that gives you an idea. Today, we're at J. In 2005, we had to start using Greek letters. This apparent calm does not mean that scientists can lower their guard. The El Nino effect is far from over. It is not until Christmas 2015 that El Nino, named after the baby Jesus, reaches its full potential. It's quite normal that we haven't yet seen any very dramatic climatic anomalies on a global scale. El Nino is still growing, and it won't be at its maximum until Christmas. Donc, le début de l'année 2015, at the beginning of 2015, avait, uh, we had a very weak anomalie, temperature uh, anomaly in the Pacific Ocean, Ocean Pacific. and the growth period is La only beginning now. The potential consequences of El Nino will not be limited to the Pacific. This meteorological system is one of the most powerful forces that affects global climate. It's not at all as localized as it seems from a European point of view. At the tropics, we have half the surface of the world that is located between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And the Pacific Ocean is a real monster in terms of the world's oceans because we have 17,000 kilometers of coast from South America to the Philippines at the other side. Torrential rainfall, droughts, serious disruption could affect our planet in the upcoming months. Even thousands of kilometers from the area where the climatic abnormality began. So there'll be huge amounts of flooding along the coast of Peru and, and uh, Bolivia, for example. There, there'll, there may be a drought in, in the northern part or the northeastern part of Brazil. So there are a lot of things which correlate very clearly with, with what happens when we have an El Nino. I mean, I think you tend to get a drought in Australia, for example. There are many things we, we can actually link to El Nino, many things we can expect to happen over the next few months. The last record-breaking El Nino was in 1997-98, with a temperature rise of 2.7 degrees Celsius. The damage caused as a result was estimated at $33 billion. By the end of 2015, El Nino is already close to a three-degree rise, allowing climatologists a glimpse into future major weather trends. There's no doubt that 2015 and 16 will be record-breaking years in terms of heat. But on the other hand, 2017 will be a cold year, because after El Nino, there will be La Nina, which is a cooling down of the Pacific, so it swings back. But in terms of heat waves, if we look at heat waves in France, we are fairly sure that if we don't reduce current global warming, we will have more heat waves. At the moment, we have two or three days of heat waves per year in France. But in the future, we expect to have up to 20 or 30 days of heat waves per year. We're pretty sure of that. In terms of storms and precipitation, the research isn't advanced enough to say anything definite yet. 
This scenario is still reversible on the condition that major political decisions are made to limit the level of greenhouse gases and to keep global warming in check. Despite a large number of natural disasters, 2015 has not been as unusual as we might imagine. Certain unexpected events, like the earthquake in Nepal, left deep wounds. Others, such as volcanic events that are easier to study, have more or less remained under control. In 2015, all the ingredients for an explosive year came together. A record-breaking El Nino, global warming, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation combined to create extreme weather events. not over yet. The dice are loaded. We can expect more severe weather patterns in 2016.